Well, I want to welcome all of you to a journey that I'm very fired up about, excited about you taking with us together. We're calling it Promises, and we're going to be talking about what can be a guarantee in our lives. There's not a lot in your life that you can say, I know that is guaranteed because there's so many variables. We're going to study what God has to say to us about what we can guarantee that he has for our lives. And so I'm excited for you to take this journey with us. I wanna look in the camera and welcome all of those watching online. I wanna welcome our McKinney campus, our Hazlitt campus, maybe someone who would watch this message later or in a video venue here at the Keller campus. Would you put your hands together and welcome all those that are joining us. We're excited that you're joining with us. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to make a brief stop at Deuteronomy chapter seven. I'll have it on the screen. But where we're gonna camp out a little bit today is the book of Hebrews chapter six. We're gonna look at verses 13 through 20. Before we jump into promises, by the way, this is, this is the first couple of week ramp up as we're laying a foundation. That's our goal today. Lay a foundation, help you understand why this is important why you wanna engage with it, so that's what we're gonna do for a couple of weeks, so you're gonna be able to get your guide uh, this weekend and get started, and so there's content there to help you get started. Small groups will start in a couple of weeks, and so we're getting ready for the journey. Before we start promises, though, I wanna say I love being your pastor. I love your passion. I love your heart for God. I love the way you jump in. I love when I say, hey, do this, it'll help you. You actually listen and you actually do it. So we had a great week of prayer and fasting. And uh, some of you are like, fasting, what's that? Well, it's denying yourself food. And um, I, I wouldn't recommend it, but I didn't make the Bible, right? So I'm not God. So uh, it's not easy. But how many of you know some of the things worth it in life are not easy? So I want to say thank you to all of you, especially all of you for the first time that fasted and prayed and came together, worshiped God. We had some incredible moments together. And here's what I promise you, is that over the next few months and throughout this year, you know, a lot of things that are really valuable, you don't see immediately. The Bible talks about a seed, planting seeds for where you wanna go, the planting seeds for a future harvest. We planted seeds the last few days. We planted seeds, and they're gonna come up, and I'm gonna share with you some of the miracles, because I've been doing this for a little while, and I see these things really come to fruition over time, so I'm gonna tell you some of them, but we're already seeing some fruit. I'm excited about the Solis family, moved here from San Antonio. Last weekend was their first weekend, and there's the pastor going, hey, let's not eat for three days. They're like, wow, this is an intense church, you know, like, wow, wow boom. You know, I'm just trying to find some friends, you know, and a good message. And uh, so they jumped in, though. They fasted. They prayed. They came. The last night, we did a prayer time. In fact, here at the Keller campus, the prayer line was all the way to the back because how many of you know people have things going on? We don't really like to show people that we have problems, but we're all frail and broken, and we all need God, and we need each other. And so we were praying. They came forward. They received prayer. They took some steps. And right here, just in a few days, they got connected. I know some of you are new. We lay out the steps for you. We like to say we're just a group of people taking the next step that God has for us. We try to make it real simple. They took it, and that's amazing. Also, at our Hazlitt campus, shout out to our Hazlitt campus that are there. We had a couple... And it's really a cool story. They wanted to have a baby. And so last prepare, they came forward and received prayer. I'm gonna start calling these prepare babies. <laughs> it's crazy, man, because we see this happen all the time. So there you go. Last prepare, come forward, receive prayer. There it is, a new little baby, a gift from God. Isn't that awesome? Right there, receive prayer. God answered their prayer. What I love about this is it's not just all of us, but we have a heart at Milestone to transfer our values to the next generation. We want our kids to love the God we love. We want our kids to know the principles of God that they're gonna need when they face real life. So we include them in the process. So they were praying, they were joined in, and man, it'll really move you. you you'll get moved if you look at the, the prayer cards on the back of our auditoriums at every location. But you go back in the back and you see these kids reaching out to God. God, I'm praying for my dad to understand me. I'm praying for my uncle to get saved. You know, the Bible says, let all the children come to me. You can't even come to me unless you have childlike faith. 
I believe God answers those prayers from those children that are reaching out to him. And so, man, I just, I see those. I'm amazed by it. It was a whole family endeavor, a church together. Thank you, thank you, thank you. How many of you guys are excited about what God's gonna do this year? It's gonna be awesome. Well, we're gonna, we're gonna jump into promises. A guarantee. You're like, wow, that's amazing. A guarantee. What's the biggest promise you've ever made? What's the biggest promise you've ever made? I don't know. I, I know one in our culture that is something that not everybody makes, but many people listening to me have made. And uh, it, it doesn't start at the moment you make the promise. It actually starts back when you're in grade school. And uh, I know for guys, you know, we don't like to admit it, but we're kind of insecure. And so we, we want to kind of get a promise from a girl. Come on now. Now, by the way, when I grew up, you used to have to have game. Because you had to talk to her. Now you just DM her. Now you just snap. You used to have to roll up on and be like, hey, what's up? I'm feeling really scared right now that you're gonna reject me. So our DM was we would get a note, pass it through our buddies, and a guy who didn't have real good game would put on the note, hey, you wanna be my girlfriend? Check yes or no. But a real smart guy would leave a third option. Maybe, come on now, I mean, so you say there's a chance. Well, that filters up to a moment where for myself, it happened in November 1995. My wife and I, we actually knew each other as kids, but she was friends with my sisters. I didn't pay a lot of attention to her. And in college, I was in college at Baylor, I was up in the area, her mom and my mom got together. I think it was kind of an arranged thing. And I went to a Christmas event, and let me just tell you, the woman of God was not 12 anymore, man. I was like, whoa, whoa, wow. So I was like, man, I'm gonna marry this girl. Went and asked my dad a few questions, and we went to, see, it wasn't like engagement today. My engagement in 1995 was at Cartwright Park. Y'all don't know where that is. It's a little small pond out in Weatherford. There were no like photograph people hanging in the trees. <laughs> there were no Instagram worthy official things. There was no multi thousands of dollars party waiting for us for everyone to take photos. It was just me and her at Cartwright Park. I gave her a ring. I borrowed some money from my dad. I bought it at Service Merchandise. Come on, everybody. <laughs> we don't even, they're not even in business anymore, man. Couldn't afford a big rock, so I just had them chip up one and put a bunch of stuff in there. Y'all know what I'm saying? I've upgraded since then, trust me. But it was a moment. My daughter, you know, she recently got engaged. They had like a special deal, you know, like down at Grapevine, all this stuff. We had a big party. They had all this stuff, lighted path, paparazzi. I mean, it was like this, Instagram. We didn't have that. But all of it builds up to a moment where I made a promise to a girl I said, I'm gonna love you for the rest of my life. It's you and no other, me and you, commitment. Gave her a ring. You know, the ring is a symbol of promise. It's a symbol of promise. I do weddings, and so when I do a wedding, I come to the ring moment. Of course, I, I'm always amazed by, here's this brother standing there, he's pale. I'm hoping he can keep standing. When I ask for the ring, his groomsmen think it's time to make a joke and act like they don't have it. But anyway, I'm just like, please guys, the dude's just barely making it through this, okay? I hold it up and say, look, this is a ring. It's circular, which means it's eternal in its evidence of commitment. It's not made of common things. It's precious because it's valuable and it's a, a sign, and we're gonna talk about it in this series. It's a human picture of a principle of promise. It's a human picture, but the truth is, it's hard for us to keep our promises. 
It's hard for us to stay committed. Things happen, life happens, challenges come our way. Some of you may think, well, I made that promise, but it didn't work, or maybe some of you are holding on to the promise, or maybe some, we're gonna learn in this series, no human promise has power unless it's backed by God's promise. You don't have the ability in and of yourself to guarantee anything unless you're holding on to the one who guarantees all. He's the one who made it this way. He's the one who designed us. He's the one who created us. He's the one who set all of this up. He's the one that knows how to do it. He's the one that comes into our lives to help us learn how to do it. In this series, we're gonna learn this. Number one, I'm laying a foundation. God is a promise-keeping God. (laughs) I'm so thankful he's a promise-keeping God. Your dad may have let you down. Your mom may have let you down. Someone may have cheated you in business. But let me tell you something. God is a promise-keeping God. He can be trusted. He's a promise-keeping God. Now, I called the series Promises because I think it's something we can get a hold of. And the word promise is in the Bible. But I'm gonna take you a little deeper in this series. We're actually gonna talk about the biblical word for promise is covenant. It's actually covenant. Now, we don't use that a lot in our language and vernacular. What'd you do today? Well, I cut a covenant. I made a covenant with somebody or I signed a covenant. We're more contractual. We have lawyers upon lawyers, insurance upon insurance, backup plan upon backup plan because we can't keep our promises to each other. So we're all the time looking for who's out to get me, so we have to keep signing contracts to hold people to their promise, but a biblical word, and in biblical times, and in the times that you see God relating to humanity, his word was not contract, his word was covenant. And it has a deeper meaning, and we're gonna learn it through this series of what does it mean that this God is a covenantal God. It's not language we use. In fact, this idea of covenant, here's what really the Genesis is. I prayed for you starting this new year. I just began to think about how valuable this is. I'm gonna make a big statement. I think the number one way to read the Bible theologically, you're like, theologically, what does that mean? That's a big word. It's, It's really simple. Theos means God, ology means study, study of God. Some people are like, well, I'm not really into theology. Everyone has a theology, just most people have a bad one. When you think about God, when you view God, it's the most important thing you think about because it shapes how you live your life. It shapes what you trust in. So theology is important And I believe the number one best theological lens to understand scripture is that God is a covenantal God. He's a God of covenant. So the biblical word for it in promises is covenant to understand God. And that's my goal in this series. I want you to understand God. I want you to see him more clearly. I want to make something that can seem very complicated, very simple. It's true that when you understand God through covenant and you understand his word, Again, you can't really do that without understanding this word, the importance of of covenant. So we're gonna understand God. And you know what my prayer is? When you really see him for who he is, you'll wanna worship him more. You really will. God is irresistible. People mess it up. Religion messes it up. Pastors have messed it up. God's irresistible. When you see him, it's kinda like when you're driving down the road. Here's one of my real pet peeves. Not when it rains hard enough to wash the dirt off, it's not a problem, but how many of you know sometimes you're driving down the road and there's just enough mist to pick up all the dirt particles and you're driving and and you don't realize what's happening and and you're driving and it's like you get behind an 18-wheeler that's in the fast lane. They need to get delivered. You know what I'm saying? Like people in the fast, the fast lane is for passing. Come forward and receive prayer if you don't understand that. (laughs) Okay? And so there you are trying to go and then it just starts and you don't know what's happening in the windshield and then all of a sudden you're like, I can't see. And then you have to hit the washer fluid. It's like when you go get your car clean and really wash, you're like, wow, it's a new world. It's like when you clean your glasses, you know, you're just like, oh, wow, look, you you hadn't cleaned them in a week. You know, man, it's a new world. When you see the God of covenant, it cleans the windshield 
You see them more clearly. And by the way, you move toward that which you see. And the world has given us a view of God. Our past, our experiences, our uncle who doesn't know what he's talking about, somebody on the internet. We're looking for guarantees in our world. We're looking for answers. We're looking for help. The problem is we're looking in the wrong place. We're looking to that which can't really help us. You're like, where is this in scripture? Deuteronomy 7, 9 says, know therefore that the Lord your God is God. What is it actually saying? There's no other gods. He's the God that really is God. He's the true and living God. He's the faithful God. He's keeping his covenant of love for us. He loves us. As a young pastor, I would struggle about what to preach on, and I would just pray, and I would ask God, God, what do I talk about, what do I talk about? And I would always hear a recurring voice, Jeff, just make sure they know how much I love them. Because love is the highest motivator. When you see how much he loves you, you'll abandon yourself to his plan for you. The covenant of love to a thousand generations. So this is an unending love of those who love him and keep his commandments. Here's a definition of covenant. Some of you are like, I've never heard the word. Some of you have heard it, but I think most Christians don't know what it is. It's a relational agreement. It's not a contractual agreement. It's a relational agreement. It's based out of the character and nature of God. A relational agreement, a partnership toward a specific purpose And it's to be treated with the utmost commitment and respect. Again, in our culture, a a ring, which we're we're trying to get there at the level of his promise to us. 900 AD, Christians were giving one another rings to symbolize commitment. World War II, men started wearing rings more so that as they went to battle, they could remember their wives. It's based on the covenant of God. It's the only way it works, but for us, we have trouble keeping our promises, so how do we let God show us what this covenant really is? I wanna take you to Hebrews. I don't know how much time you've read in the book of Hebrews. It's one of the unique New Testament books. It's really interesting. You're like, what is its purpose? Well, the writer of Hebrews is talking to a primarily Jewish audience. These are Jewish people who have given their life to Christ. They've accepted Christ, so now they have their Jewish practices and their Jewish laws, and they're trying to understand, like, how do we continue to practice our faith in Christ, and what does that mean for what has been happening for centuries, where only special people could meet with God? And the priests had to go in and and make special application. We're going to learn all that in this series of how, how Jesus is the fulfillment He's the fulfillment of all the types and the shadows. In fact, you may have struggled with the Bible, the Old Testament. You're like, I don't understand it. It's weird stories. It's like, what do I do with it? There are even people today who say we don't need it. No, no, no. The Old Testament, let me help you here. The Old Testament, then the New Testament, what it really is a picture of, the Old Covenant, the Old Agreement Now the new agreement in Christ. I want you to understand this. Every Old Testament story is a type. It's a shadow. It's a prelude. It's a preliminary picture of everything fulfilled in Christ. The Bible says all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. In fact, when you hear me preach, I preach out of the Old Testament. We need the Old Testament because it's showing how awesome God is, how faithful he is. You know, if we're in a place today where we're like, I don't know if Jesus will return. I don't know if Jesus is the only way to heaven. What you don't realize, because so many people don't know all the promises is, you're actually leaning on your own guarantee while denying hundreds of years of God keeping his promise. Every single thing he said would happen, happened. Every single thing he laid out took place. He's got the greatest of track records. In fact, every time I read an Old Testament or preach on an Old Testament story, I'll bring it into Christ. We're gonna do that in this series. We're talking about the Old Covenant, New Covenant. Hebrews, though, look what he says. When God made his promise to Abraham, we're gonna talk about Abraham next week. If you wanna grow in your faith next week, you want less fear and more faith, next week we're gonna talk about Abraham. Look, I don't have time to unpack the whole Abraham story, but let's look at it here. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, 
What, what's he saying here? God made a promise to Abraham and there was nobody capable of being a reference on his resume. <laughs> God can't get any references for his resume. Man, we're looking for some kind of expert to help us. It's amazing how I talk to people today. We're looking, it, you know, we're good. How many times do you think COVID-19 has been Googled? How many times do you think inflation has been Googled? How many times do you think, you know, economy, housing market, Google, Google, Google. Look, God can't be Googled. There's no political pundit. There's no person talking on the internet. There's no medical professional. It's like professional upon professional, degree upon degree. Let me tell you, it's gonna be okay if you do this, and we don't know if anybody knows what they're talking about. And it's frustrating. When you're looking to people who don't have the answer to tell you the answer, you live frustrated. You live frustrated. He says, look, there was nobody that could back up my resume, so I'm just gonna swear by myself. My nature, my character, who I am. He swore by himself saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. Now, if you don't know Abraham's story, he's old, and God's saying, I'm gonna make you a father of many nations, so he's gonna give him all these children, and his wife's old, and it doesn't look possible, but God said it. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. We're gonna talk about how we can receive what is promised next week. People swear by someone greater than themselves and the oath confirms what is said and it puts an end to all arguments. When you get in an argument, you're looking for a mediator and what you're really looking for is somebody to confirm you're the one that's right. Anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> My wife and I have had a few arguments. I always think I'm right. The older you get in marriage, the more you realize, you know what, I'm just gonna be wrong because it's a whole lot better when I'm wrong and we can then have a makeup session. Y'all know what I'm saying? <laughs> I was wrong, forgive me, let's make up. <laughs> we went to the mountains with my kids. My kids are older now. Uh, I have two out of the house, so when I talk about family, I've got some experiences I can share with you. My daughter just getting married, and so it was really a real unique season for us having now my married children with me. I preach 70,000 Christmas services, and then we take off to the mountains. And, and uh, you say, how do you get your older kids to spend time with you? Problem. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, so I bring them with me. That's a different message. But anyway, we're hanging out. I'm cooking breakfast or this. And then, then when we get there, we get kind of settled in. Then it starts the game plan because at night they're going to play games. And I realized this year now that the level I'm at, I've got to not play the game because there's going to be a lot of arguments. Because see, I didn't grow up where we let your kids win. We dominate you. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm going to win. If you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so I realized for the sake of harmony, I better be the mediator of the game. Boy, I'm going to tell you, you talk about the appeals, my kids, dad. I mean, it's like, and, and they're competitive. So I realized for us to have a good time together, somebody's got to mediate the arguments, okay? Here's what he says. I put an end to all the arguments. I put an end to all the dispute, and all of the back and forth. He says, I put an end to it because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised. He confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. Everyone to say impossible. Hazlitt Campus here, impossible. Come on, say it with me, impossible. Like there's a chance he could be holding out on us? No, he says it's impossible for him to lie. Impossible. We who have fled, we who have fled, why do we look to sources that can't help us? Because we don't really know if he's telling us the truth. Because our dad lied to us, so-and-so lied to us, the TV lies to us, the internet lies to us, everybody's trying to sell me on something, so what do we do? We run from the very source that can help us. We run away from God. I know a lot of times we're real mad at God. But you know what, let me just kind of defend God a little bit. We didn't do it his way. Most of the time. Now, there's bad things that just happen, and we can't explain it, not even a preacher. But there are things in our lives 
that we know we abandoned his plan for our marriage. We abandoned his plan for our kids. We abandoned his plan for our relationships. We abandoned his plan for our resources. We abandoned his plan, then we end up on our own going, God, can you fix this? He's like, why did you run from me in the first place? Why did you run from me? I have a covenant of love to a thousand generations. I'm your father. I made you. I'm concerned for you. There's access to me. Don't run from me. We fled, look what it says, to take hold of the hope set before us. And we may be greatly encouraged. Look what it says. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul. We have this hope. His nature, his character, his promise, his love for us is an anchor for the soul. I want to spend the rest of our time talking about that. Firm and secure, by the way. Stable. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. We're gonna hit some of these images, the veil that you hear in these worship songs that you don't know what that means. We're gonna talk about that in this series where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf. Let's talk about an anchor for the soul. I've been a senior pastor for 27 years. I've dedicated my life to his church and his people. My greatest passion is for you to win, for you to have who God and be who God's called you to be and do what God's called you to do for your kids to win. That's my greatest passion. I I want you to key in for a minute. 27 years, I've never seen a season of time with more unstable people. Now, I'm gonna tell you, pastors, we've been in overdrive. We've been in overdrive. Pastors, you can't get an appointment with a counselor hardly. Unstable everywhere. Now, I'm not talking about if you're here and you're like, Jeff, I'm real unstable. There's hope for you too. And God can get you taking steps, but I'm gonna tell you what's been concerning to me. I'm talking about generally stable people where I'm like, are you being serious right now? Hold on a minute. So what has happened is the wind and the wave of uncertainty has hit our world. And you're like, well, why is everyone unstable? It didn't create instability. It only revealed what we're anchored to. Pressure cannot create, pressure only reveals. When you press on a toothpaste tube, it pushes out toothpaste. So what's really challenging for us is we've anchored ourselves, and we have a world where this is how we do life. It presses us, anchor yourself to me. Today, on your feet is gonna have all kinds of options to anchor yourself. If you'll get this, if you'll do that, if you'll go here, you'll be more anchored to what you need to live the life that you wanna live. And the problem is the anchor's not strong enough. Since it's using anchor language, let's talk about anchors. When this was written, it was probably a stone. And you would take the stone and tie it to a tether. You tether. I like the outdoors. I like boating. And so what happened was stones didn't have enough density. So then with the invention of metal, we got something heavier. So we began to use that. Did you know today we use anchors some, but you don't have to have as many anchors today because of technology. You can get a GPS coordinate. And if you have enough thrust in your trolling motor or power in your batteries, then that technological connection can actually hold you on a GPS point. But whether it is a GPS spot lock on a boat or a stone, or a metal anchor, here's the principle. The power, the tether, the strength of the rope, and more importantly, the weight of what's holding you has to be stronger than the wind and the waves. It has to be stronger. It's not not if, it's the when. It's going to happen. There is going to be a when moment when it all hits you. And the question is, what are you anchored to? Kids, kids today struggling with more than I've ever seen as a pastor. Can I encourage some of you young families? We have to teach them to be anchored to God. We make them the center of our universe. We make the whole world. Look, I love my kids, but let me give you a little parenting tip. If you make them the center of the universe, now I come from the old school. Now I'm not talking about abusing your kids, though I think maybe we were abused. I don't know, it's just like it's... (laughs) It wasn't about you. It wasn't about you. I see parents say, I cook my kids special stuff to show them what I love. I love them. Not when I, if we're having a turkey dinner, I I only eat the leg. I'd have loved to tell my dad that. Here's the neck. (laughs) 
It's not about you. And you're like, well, I don't know if I like that. It's good. It's good. What happens today is we set our kids up as the center of the universe. And by the way, don't do this. If you don't understand that we anchor to God, we anchor to mom and dad, we build a safe place. What happens is out of our dysfunction of being not anchored to God and not anchored to each other, we anchor ourselves to them. And let me tell you, they're a terrible place and source of your worship. They will let you down. And why do they feel insecure? Because no human being was made to be the center of the universe. You put them there and the planets revolve around them, you're, you actually are abusing them because they will have no friends because nobody wants to be around somebody that everything has to be the way they want it. Nobody. Nobody wants to be around someone who's a brat. You're like, well, I like my kids. Here's what I always love to ask parents. Does anybody else? You have to love them. We would prefer you don't bring them to our house. <laughs> teenagers are more insecure today. I've never seen so many teenagers with so much anxiety. Again, there's, this is an epidemic, and it's because of what we've anchored them to. When I wrote the book, Who Am I?, where I was talking about identity, I wanted to understand teenagers at a different level. So I asked the high school at Keller High School if I could use their library. I invited some kids. I sat around the table. I said, tell me about your pressures. I didn't know it as a pastor, but that night I got a revelation. They started talking to me about the pressure that not only that's put on them, but the pressure they have on themselves. And what has happened, and again, I'm not saying we shouldn't channel them toward using their gifts and growing. I'm a coach. I want people to get better. I mean, I get this, but let's talk about something here that's out of whack, okay? Let's be very clear. If you anchor yourself to how good your grades are only in your performance, if you anchor yourself to only the college you go to, if you anchor yourself as to whether you are on the right select baseball team, if you anchor yourself to that, that's going to move. It's going to move. And man, by the time I listened to them, I was crying. They were crying. Man, I, I got a revelation listening to them. And by the way, it's tough when your kids go through hard things. But I'm, you know, I know. It's like, I want to save them. I want to help them. Don't exempt your kids from the hard things that made you who you are by going to their teacher and defending their zero. Make them do it. Because when their boat leaves your harbor and the wind hits their boat? Anybody grown up a little bit and know what I'm talking about? You hit a point in life where your dad's anchor can't hold your boat. Your mom's anchor can't hold your boat. So we have to teach them now to go to God, now to anchor themselves to the right things that can provide hope so that when they leave our little marina, boy, here in the suburbs, we got a perfect little marina. You'll never have a pain. We got it. They're leaving that marina at some point. And we got to start now teaching them how to navigate the rough waters of life. Moms have insecurities. They do. All the pressure today, you got to be the mom, you got to be fit, got to have a side hustle, got to have a blog, got to get the perfect Instagram photo with the perfect muffin with the light shining in. There it is, perfect. <laughs> got to do all that. Never met a woman that looked in the mirror that didn't say, hey, I could, I could fix that. I wish that was better. A man look in the mirror, got hair growing out his ears, his back. He'll be like, we're doing good, man. We're doing good. <laughs> Men are insecure. They don't like to tell you. Men have the anchors in their life that, that end up. I've prayed with two people, three people in the last two weeks anchored to the wrong things. Men, let me tell you, we gravitate toward what we win at. So if you gravitate only to your career and leave your home and family behind, hear me and hear me well. If you love your work, your work will not love you back. When you get to my phase of life, it won't be about your career. It'll be about how well your kids and your family and your how that's going. So invest in the right things. But we can't give what we don't have. You can't give hope unless you know where hope is found. So we have to learn how to anchor our boats to the right things. You're like, Pastor Jeff, you're preaching on this. Do you need it? Of course I do. 
I've been very transparent. When all of these chaos hit, it was a tough time to be a leader, tough time to be a pastor. I'm not pleased with some of my responses. I'm not pleased. I realized I was a little bit too concerned with people's opinion a little bit. I'm a pastor. I love people. I mean, I want to help you. I want to hear from you. But I've never had a time in 27 years where more people had an opinion about stuff they have no idea about and what I should preach on. I realized I was a little too tethered to public opinion, and I had to do a little soul searching. I had to do a little apologizing. I had to do a little repenting, and I had to get back to the place where, you know what, Jesus? I'm doing this for you. I'm here to please you. I care about your opinion. We all can get off. That boat, man, can start dragging and, man, taking on water. And it's like, okay, wait a minute. We got to get this anchor back secure. You say, Pastor, how do you do it? Two ways. I'm going to close with this. Two ways. I'm laying a foundation. This is not earth shattering, but this is how it works. Number one, you have to trust God. You have to trust God. You commit to, you abandon yourself to that which you trust. Bottom line, can somebody with some credentials tell me what I need to do? Well, well, look, God has the plan. And you'll abandon to him if you trust that he really does know what he's talking about and that he has what you need. You'll abandon yourself to it. But see, that requires faith. Faith and trust mixed together. They're like the perfect cocktail mixed together that really make it work in our life. I can't see it. I don't feel it. I sometimes don't want to. I don't like it. But trust actually says, who cares what I feel? Who cares what I like? God can be trusted, so here I am. I'm ready. Because when you get desperate, you're looking for help. A lot of desperate people in our world today looking for hope. Hope's the seedbed of faith. Faith is what overcomes fear. Faith is what guarantees your future, not your faith in yourself, not what you've anchored yourself to, but your faith in God. Let's think about it when we get sick. I'm a terrible patient. Terrible. Awful. My wife is beast. She just amazes me. Of course, you don't want mom to go down because, man, the, the house becomes martial law at that point. <laughs> Mom gets sick, it, we're, we're toast, you know? What are you gonna eat? Whatever you can find, it's every man for himself. You know, I'm gonna eat yours if you find something good. I mean, I get sick, I'm terrible, you know? She's like, Terminator, I'll be back. I'm like, oh man, you get the stomach bug? If I get the stomach bug, after I throw up the fourth time, I'm like, just take me to heaven. Just take me to heaven, I'm good, I'm going home. I mean, it's just like, I'm done, I'm just... And when you get, you get desperate enough, you're like, just tell me what I need to take. Now, my wife's into these things, these, these things. I don't really know. I mean, last night I went home, my 17-year-old, she's putting something in her drink. She's like, you know, it's getting dangerous, Dad. I'm like, what are you drinking? She's like, elderberry. I'm like, cool. What do them berries do? She's like, it helps you, Dad. I'm like, okay, cool. So they do elderberries and echinaceas and all these things that I've never heard the name of. They do oils and stuff. You're like, what do you do, Pastor Jeff? z pack that's what I do. z pack amoxicillin. That, that's what I do, okay? I'm into that. But when I get sick enough, I'm taking the z pack and to please my wife, I'm like, I'll take the elderberry. I'll take the ex uh, oil. I'm in. I'm into all of it. Because if you get desperate enough, you're just looking for help. You're just looking for help. Why is it that God is the last place we go? Why is that the last place we go? Because he's the one that has the help. We not only have to trust him, we have to obey him. That's where it starts getting real. Because you have to connect the dots between what you say you believe and actually how you live. We have an American culture that's just God and Jesus, and we just kind of sprinkle Jesus on everything we want to do. We just kind of whatever. No, 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 no. If you really study scripture to have real faith, it has to be backed up by how you actually live your life. So we're having trouble connecting the dots and a covenant understanding starts helping us gravitate toward getting integrity, which integrity is a congruency to where our lives start aligning with that which we say to be true.
It's an old hymn. Trust and obey, for there's no other way. I was actually the song leader at the first church. They hired me as a youth pastor. They didn't have a song leader. I don't know anything about music, so I just was like, okay, I'll lead the songs. <clears throat> Trust and obey, for there's no other way. And then you gotta do the motions. And I don't know the motions exactly. I still to this day don't know. I don't know if it's kind of the sign of the cross thing that the guy's doing. I don't know if it should be point to point or if there should be a swoop. I like the swoop because I feel good about that. And then I just kind of develop my own trust and obey. But you know that guy up there doing that? What is it? Some of you musical people, you know. I mean, it's, it. Anyway. Trust and obey. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. I've never seen so many unhappy people. Well, is it a trust problem? Probably. That leads to an obey problem. Trust and obey. Not because I have to obey, but because he loves me and he wants the best for me. I want what he has for me. Obey or I'll fry you. No. Trust and obey. Trust. Love, you do what you love. You do what you love. Love changes it from being an external performance to a desire. And I want to encourage some of you. You, don't, you, you maybe don't know about this Christianity thing. It's, it's really a weird thing. You can even have all hell breaking loose in your life and you go, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to do what you want, Lord. And there's a supernatural peace when you're in that zone that you can't explain. Because it's how you were designed. And you're like, okay, I haven't seen anything change. Trust and obey. Trust and obey. Trust and obey. Because there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me. Some of you here, you've never received Christ. You never really abandoned yourself to him. Jesus doesn't offer religion. He offers a relationship. And he says, I love you and I promised you my love for you. I backed it up with my own name and you simply can just say, Jesus, come into my life wherever you're at, Hazlitt, online, wherever you're at, just say, Jesus, here's my life. I believe you died for me, rose from the dead. Come into my life. Become my Jesus. I wanna have a relationship with you. Accept him today. It'd be the greatest decision you've ever made. We wanna help you walk that out. You can come forward at the end. You can fill out a card. You can come to 101. I want to help you learn what that means. But second of all, Lord, we thank you that you've made a covenant with us. And I pray over the next few weeks, Lord, we would grow in our understanding of how trustworthy you are. Lord, you are faithful. You have, you have loved us. You have taken care of us. And Lord, we just want to abandon ourselves to you at a greater level because you love us so much. In Jesus' name, amen.